Our scripture this morning is found in Amos chapter 4. Amos chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Many of y'all may not know that I was an Eagle Scout as a young man. Uh, went all the way through scouting, did the whole Cub Scouts, Weeblows, Boy Scouts. Was the youngest person in Newport ever to earn Eagle Scout. I said all of that to say this. If you know anything about scouting at all, what is scouting's motto? Be prepared. That's why I have to wear a belt. Because I got so much junk I carry around on me just in case something ever comes up that I might need it. All right. I, I mean, I used to be worse. I used to have a briefcase. I almost needed a trailer hitch on my belt because I had so much stuff in it. It was, it was, it was so heavy. Being prepared for whatever we face is always a good thing. You know, you, you can ask Angie. If we go to another church, guess what's inside my Bible? A sermon. Just in case. Just in case the pastor recognizes that I'm a pastor and says, Brother, would you come and minister God's Word to us today? I don't want to go, uh... Jesus loves me, this I know. I want to be prepared. I got to tell you an unfortunate truth, beloved, that should the Lord tarry, everyone in this room is going to die. And even if He were to come right now, we all must be prepared to meet God. That's the whole point of Scripture is that we have to be prepared to meet God, are we? Amos chapter 4, verses 1 through 14, in honor, or 13, in honor of the reading of God's Word, let's stand. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring now that we may drink. The Lord God has sworn by His holiness. Behold, the days are coming upon you when they will take you away with meat hooks and the last of you with fish hooks. You will go out through breaches in the walls, each one straight before her, and you will be cast to Harmon, declares the Lord. Enter Bethel and transgress. In Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a thank offering also from that which is leavened, and proclaim free will offerings. Make them known, for so you love to do, you sons of Israel, declares the Lord God. But I gave you also cleanness of teeth in all your cities, and lack of bread in all your places. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Furthermore, I withheld the rain from you while there was still three months until harvest. Then I would send rain on one city, and and on another city I would not send rain. One part would be rained on while the part not rained on would dry up. So two or three cities would stagger to another city to drink water, but would not be satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I smote you with scorching wind and mildew, and the caterpillar was devouring your many gardens and vineyards, fig trees and olive trees. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I sent a plague among you after the manner of Egypt. I slew your young men by the sword along with your captured horses, and I made the stench of your camp rise up in your nostrils. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand snatched from the blaze. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. 
For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what are his thoughts, he who makes dawn into darkness and treads on the high places of the earth, the Lord of God of hosts is his name. Let us pray. Father God, we love you so much, and we thank you for the reading of your perfect and infallible word in our midst. And God, we just ask that you would illumine our hearts and minds as you illumined the heart of Amos when you gave to him this perfect and infallible word. We pray, O oh God, that you would turn our hearts back to you and that we would truly be prepared to meet you. God, we love you with all of our soul. We trust you with all of our heart, and we offer to you our love our lives, and this prayer in and through the name of our risen Lord and Master, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Repentance is a word we don't really like to talk about in our society today. Okay? The whole reason we don't like to talk about repentance is because we we all have this complex where we absolutely abhor admitting, admitting that we were wrong that we ever did anything wrong. We don't like to say that we were wrong. But from the opening pages of Scripture, all the way through Scripture, repentance is a major thing. Over and over again. Listen, beloved, the whole point of the prophets, both major and minor, the whole point of the prophets, if I had to, to, to drill down all of the prophetic uh, words to one word, it would be repent. Repent. That's what the prophets, what God sent the prophets to proclaim. What was the first word of John the Baptist's ministry? Repent. What was the first word of Jesus' public ministry? Repent. Repentance is a major topic throughout all of Scripture. True repentance is an amazing thing. It means that we have seen the errors of one's way. How many of y'all have ever worked on a live electrical circuit? And, and then got a little bit of kink in your hair because you know what I'm saying, right? Maybe even spoke in tongues as a result of that experience. How many of y'all have repented of that behavior that you will never again work on a live electrical circuit, okay? I mean, it's not enough for me. It's not enough... To, to turn the light on on that circuit and then go downstairs and find either the fuse or the breaker, okay? Not only does that give me a visual confirmation, when I come back upstairs, I bring my meter with me. And I meter that circuit, okay, just to make absolutely sure that I'm not about to light myself up, all right? Repentance is genuinely turning from the error of our ways. It is turning us out. It is, I mean, you've heard me say it, that it is walking one way and then turning around and walking the absolute opposite direction. And, you know, it, it gets kind of complicated to, to explain all of this because we say that we're turning away from bad behavior and we're turning toward good behavior. And that makes it sound that this is a whole works-based system here. That what God wants you to do is to turn away from bad behavior and then to clean your life up and get everything straightened out and walk the way that you ought to. And if you put it just that way, guess what? It's not about God anymore. It's about what we're doing. It's about us recognizing that that was bad. Well, let me ask you a question. If God's not in it, why is it bad? If, if God is not the standard, then how are you going to determine that your behavior was bad in the first place? Didn't Jesus say that it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person? See, that's behavior, right? Right? That's behavior. 
It doesn't matter what I eat. It doesn't matter what I put into my mouth. It's not going to defile me. What defiles me is what comes out of my mouth. Because what comes out of my mouth, you'd say, well, preacher, that's behavior too. It is, but that behavior is showing the condition of my heart. Okay? What well, we've got to, listen to me, beloved. We behave the way that we behave because we are either a Christian or we're not. A dog behaves the way it behaves because it's a dog. A cat behaves the way it behaves because it's a cat. A zebra behaves the way it behaves because it's a zebra. We should behave the way that, that, that we do, not, not so that we can impress God. Because you know where that ends up? You know where that ends up? God, I thank Thee that I am not like that man over yonder, a sinner. Might be something in the New Testament about that. Might be something from the mouth of Jesus about that. Because, listen, when we start making our behavior the standard, we're in need of repentance. The life... Here's the problem with a lot of our witnessing. We've got somebody that, that we know is a sinner. Why, why, how do we know they're a sinner? Because they ain't like us. That's a whole other sermon. But we know that they're a sinner because they ain't like us. They don't do the same things we do, so we know they got to be a sinner. And so what do we do? What's our witnessing strategy? Well, now listen to me, brother. Listen to me, sister. Here's what, here's what you got to do. You got to stop drinking. You got to start dressing in this way. And by the way, while we're on it, go get a haircut. You got to start coming to church every time the doors are open. You got to stop cussing. You got to stop doing this, that, and other. Who's in control of that relationship now? Well, showing Jesus. I'm in control of it because I've told them what they've got to do to be acceptable to me. What does the Bible say they got to do to be acceptable to God? Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, period, full stop, end of story. See, beloved, what I love about Jesus, you know one of the things I I, I dislike the most about going fishing? Cleaning them things. I mean, I don't mind it. I can do it, but... I don't like cleaning fish. You might like cleaning fish. I just don't like cleaning fish. Okay? It's nasty. Okay? And that's what's so great about our role in evangelism. Because our role is you catch them, he'll clean them. He'll clean them. Listen, I'll tolerate an awful lot in somebody's life because I know that God is still working on them. God is still involved in their life. It takes an awful lot for me to say to somebody, listen, stop coming to church here. Okay? It takes an awful lot for me to say, stop coming to church here. As long, listen, as long as I know that Jesus is, is working in their life, the story's not over yet. The story's not over yet. That'd be like me being an emergency room doctor. Somebody come in and say, well, listen, if you'd stop bleeding, I'll take care of you. But I ain't messing with all that blood. That's dangerous. That's nasty. I ain't ain't fooling with that. And where were you when you got hurt? Mercy, you stink. No, beloved. We love people the way they come to us. And we don't, listen, we don't try to make them in our image. We try to make them in the image of God. Or let God make them in His own image. What was the charge we saw over and over again that God made? You have not returned to me. 
He said, I've been trying to get your attention. I've been trying to get your attention. And you have not returned to me. <clears throat> now, here's the problem. A lot of people in Amos's day were pointing their fingers at the wrong thing. They said, what God wants you to be is wealthy. God wants you to be affluent. Aren't you glad we ain't going by any hucksters like that running around today? You want me to start calling names? That they say God's entire goal in your life is for you to be wealthy. That God's entire goal in your life is for you to be affluent, for you to be healthy or whatever. Listen, beloved, God's entire goal in your life is for you to repent. To repent. That's the beginning of the Christian life. And it's the way that the Christian life is lived. And it's not lived in your own strength. It's not lived in your own power. It is lived in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amos comes, and, and, and we're going to see it in a little bit. Amos begins the sermon, mercy. But what Amos sees is a society just like ours. It is a society that is consumed with self-interest. What's in it for me? What enjoyment? What, what can I get out of this experience? What can I get out of this relationship? What can I get out of this church? Oh, did I just go there? What can I get out of this worship service? Amos says that, that the, 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 the problem that they have is that they're focused on themselves and not on God. See, that's the whole thing. If you ask them, and if you ask the average Christian today, what is God? They would say, God is love. And that's true. I'm not saying it's not. God is love. But listen to me, beloved. What is God's defining characteristic? Holiness. God's love flows out of God's holiness. Don't you ever forget that. God's love flows out of God's holiness. God's judgment flows out of God's holiness. God is holy. Listen, beloved, He is so holy that the Scripture has to say He is holy, holy, holy. He is so much different than us than we can't, we can't even begin to, to comprehend it. And so Amos is saying that this society has got their focus on the wrong thing. Because, he, he, here's the deal, if we try to define God only as, as love, you know what we're saying? We're saying God loves us so much that He'll tolerate our sin. But what I want to say to you this morning is that God is so holy, He cannot tolerate sin. He cannot. Now some of y'all are going, well, preacher, what about 1 John 4? John says God is love. Yes, he does. And then he, he lays that out. See, this is the problem when we just take a verse out of context. Or we just lift a verse out to, to make a point. You got to read more than just that verse to see the entire message that, that John has given to us in 1 John 4 and in, first, and in his epistle, 1 John. Yes, John wants us to know that God is love. But if you read John, you understand what I said a moment ago, that God's love flows out of God's holiness. God's love flows out of holiness. And we're going to see how this is important in just a minute. Bottom line, God calls us to be prepared to meet Him. Verses 1 through 3. We're going to go through this pretty quick. In some translations of verse 1, it is you fat cows abation. You fat cows abation. Mm. How many of y'all be blessed if the first words of my sermon were you reprobates? Okay. You're probably not going to get any amens. All right. You are definitely not going to get any amens from the ladies. Uh Here's what that means. 
In some places in the world, you're not going to see too many people that are overweight. Why? Because they haven't got enough to eat. They haven't got enough to eat. And when you do see someone that's overweight, you know one of two things. Either they have access to the wrong kind of food and it's empty calories, or this person's got some money. They've got money. They're affluent. And they're able to eat better than everybody else around them. And so throughout history, overweight people were seen as a sign of affluence. Well, bless God, I ought to be the richest man on the planet. Because you can tell I, I, I don't turn down too many meals. What Amos is saying, listen, how would you feel if you lived somewhere where the average family w- was, was working all day long to be able to get enough money to go and buy enough rice to feed their family tonight? And if they were really, really, really fortunate, they might be able to buy a little bit of chicken, okay, to put some protein in that meal. And you went home and had a big old thick T-bone with a baked potato smothered in butter, whatever else you wanted. Close the shade over there, them hungry people. That's, mm, I don't want to see that while I'm eating. And that's what Amos says these women are doing. That they're, that they're just oppressing the poor. We've seen movies where a lady would, would be one of those stay-at-home women. And I'm not saying staying at home is bad, ladies. That's not what I'm saying at all. You understand the one I'm talking about, the ones that are rich. Okay, their husband makes tons of money. They got 15 cars out in the garage. 20-room mansion with 37 bathrooms in it. And, and, and this lady is a monster in her home with the servants. And they're saying to their husbands, you need to go out and make some more money. You need to go out and make some more money. The Joneses living right next door to us have three chariots and we've only got two. You need to go make some more money. And then look at God's reaction. The Lord has sworn by His holiness. And in verse 3, He pronounces His judgment. Do you understand, beloved? Hmm. How many of y'all have ever sped past a police officer and you looked in the mirror and he didn't turn around, didn't turn the blue lights on? And what was the first thought in your mind? I got away with it. I got away with it. Can I tell you a secret? There's no getting away with it in God's economy. There is no getting away with it in God's economy. God says He has sworn by His holiness. The days are coming when they'll take you away with meat hooks. Ladies, let me contextualize this for you. The way that the Assyrians would send people into captivity is that they would come in and they would strip everybody naked. And then they would put a fish hook through your lip or through your ear. And there would be a, a chain or some kind of a, a, a string or something that bound you to the person in front of you that also had a fish hook through their ear or through their lip. Okay? Okay? So you're walking through the street naked, okay? And, and, and everybody's going, wait a minute, could we go back to fat cows? Because I'm way more on board with being called a fat cow than I am with, with what God says is coming. And God says, they're going to take you away with those meat hooks. 
You are going to go out through the breaches in the walls, those things that you thought were going to protect you. You thought your money would protect you. You thought your army would protect you. You thought the king would protect you. You thought the walls would protect you. But guess what God says? You're going to walk through those through holes in those walls naked with a fish hook in your lip. Because I continually reached out to you And you didn't come. Verses 4 and 5. Here's what God says. And it's going to sound shocking. Let me translate it to you in modern English. Why don't you just go on to church and sin? That's what he's saying. Just go on to church. Go on to church and sin. Go on to church drunk. Go on to church and let everybody know how, how good you are. Go on to church and, and, and make an offering that I haven't asked. Go on to church and make a polluted offering, verse 5. Make a thank offering from that which is leavened. You understand why sometimes we're opposed to gambling money or lottery money? It's leavened. It's leavened. Making an offering to God with something that is leavened and proclaim free will offerings. You know what that means? It means that, you know what, I've already put my check in here. But guys, I want, I don't have any money on me. That's, that was it. I brought all my money in. But anyway, you know, it'd be like me pulling my wallet out and saying, listen, I want to make a free will offering today and start pulling out $100 bills and letting y'all see me drop those hundreds into the, into the offering plate. That's what they're doing. They want everybody. To see how rich they are. Hmm. And then he says, bring your tithes every three days. Bless God, yeah, please bring your tithes every three. I'd be satisfied if you bring them once a week. But what Amos is saying here is that the requirement that they're talking about this particular offering was required every three years. And Amos is saying, I tell you what, let's just take it up a notch. And you bring it every three days. Just go on to church and sin. Go on to church and and do all of the things that you know. Go on to church and reach out to a God that you know isn't real. Go on to church and reach out to, to this thing that is false. And then boast about it. Verses 6 through 13. God pronounced His judgment on unrepentant hearts. I said, God pronounced His judgment on unrepentant hearts. Beloved, repentance repentance is not a one and done. Can, can, Can I get that through our hearts? Repentance is not one and done. What happens if I was walking this way And then I repent and begin walking this way. Am I still in repentance? I've stopped walking. I've stopped walking in repentance. Repentance is a continuous, ongoing process in our lives. Yes, there is a one and done. Okay? When, when John the Baptist said, and when Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of God is at end, they meant do it right now. Right now. But it is also an ongoing process. And I want you to see, listen, I want you to see because you've probably seen this in your life or you may be going through this in your life right now or you may be seeing somebody else having this go through in their life. Do you see what God is doing? Go back to the Exodus, Okay. Did God bring the big guns in the first plague? Was the first plague the death of the, of the firstborn? No. No. It was a minor inconvenience. It was something that God was using to get their attention. But Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. God says, throughout all of this process, I sent these things in. I kept ratcheting it up just like I did in the Exodus. Yet you have not returned to me. 
And so God announced his coming judgment on all the repentant. In verse 12, God calls them to prepare to meet your God. Your God. Your God. Do you understand that's double-edged? Because a lot of these people were worshiping false gods. They were worshiping false gods. I want to go meet, well, I was going to use a particular character that's popular this time of year. I want to go meet that character. No such thing. No such thing. I'm going to be disappointed if that's the goal of my life. God is saying if you're, if you're prepared to meet this non-existent, this invisible God that doesn't exist, you're going to be disappointed. And you're not going to just be disappointed that day. You're going to be disappointed throughout all of eternity. But on the other hand, we can prepare to meet God. We have to be ready to stand before God and give an account for the way that we have lived. We must meet the one whose laws we have broken. Who's, can I tell you something, beloved? You look in that rearview mirror all you want to. And just because you don't see blue lights flashing, that doesn't mean God doesn't know that you broke the law. God knows. God knows. We must meet the one and be examined by he who has seen our heart and read our thoughts and jotted down our affections and remembered our idle words. We must meet him. We must meet the one who is never duped. The God who sees through the veils of hypocrisy and concealment in our lives. There will be no making ourselves out to be better than we are before Him. Prepare to meet your God, beloved. How? God has made all of the provision. He made the provision in the Lord Jesus Christ and His sacrifice on Calvary's cross. He offered the atoning, all-sufficient sacrifice for the sin of sinners who flee to Him acknowledge their sin, and receive the forgiveness that only Jesus and His saving sacrifice can bring. The only hope for any individual is through repentance, through turning completely away from a life of sin, turning to Jesus and trusting in what He is doing in our lives. Will we be prepared?